Thank you, Jebra. That was an amazing, amazing speech. Um, I just might uh, open the floor to questions now. There'll be people running around with microphones. So if you just put up your hand, someone should get to you. Hi, um, Ernie Drucker from uh, New York City. I work at New York University in public health now. And I want to thank this panel for talking about this picture of the world that so many of us in America are clueless about and really need to understand. I think Deborah's summary of the human rights side of this is tremendous. So thank you very much. I haven't been able to get to one of these conferences for quite a few years. But uh, I, I think the organization has made tremendous project, progress in this time and are needed at this moment. And it is a critical moment. And we have no map for a lot of that in our experience in the United States, I'll tell you that. And uh, I think the drug issue is one with the overdose aspect of it is, is something that we can build on fantastically. And we're doing a project in the American South. A number of people are here from that project. And if it takes off the way it might, we're going to have something to do. So my question to the board is, what about countries within a country that are, are, are ignored by that country? How to, how to call attention to that and, and change the, uh, um, the response from public health people with, with, where it's a body count at this point. It's vast in America. So Ernie, thank you for that. Um, so I, I want to, uh, this is going to sound weird, but I want to make an analogy between the U.S. and Brazil, um, which is actually one of the places I wanted to talk about, but I didn't have a lot of time. There is a conversation that prevails in the world about Brazil that most of the problems exist in the favelas, and that favelas are like these discreet ghetto communities and sort of um, spaces of poverty, etc. But the thing that I found in traveling to Brazil, and I've been there five times now, is that the whole country is a favela. The majority of where people live are what is called favelas. The exception are the beach communities where the rich people are. And so if you have a policy where the majority of the people in your country live in areas that you've declared to be war zones, then that means everybody there is a potential enemy and a potential casualty of war. And I make that analogy because the US is very similar. You know, we have this conversation that we have all these wonderful affluent communities, but the majority of America is what I call Walmart world, where that represents your best option for retail buying for everything. And it also is a mentality of a race to the bottom. And so yes, most Americans live in Walmart world, which means that they're subject to Walmart world law enforcement, whether they're white, black, or whatever. And given this particular administration that's come in, we're going to see more of that. And there's not going to be a lot of public health response because they've taken the money away from the public health institutions because we don't have a commitment to health, at least not in the US. And so I actually think that our work will become more challenging and that it will be even more important for us to find ways to collaborate with other groups and other organizations and other people who are really committed to preserving human rights and human life. Hi, I don't actually have a question, but I just want to say how amazing it is to have an uh, opening plenary of all women. Thank you. Hi, good morning to everyone, and thanks very much for the opportunity. I, my question is um, related to Olga. 
Uh, so I want to find out uh, in the work that you do in North Africa, um, what are you doing to try and improve that um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in terms of trying to you know, widen your reach um, in other parts of Africa elsewhere? And if you've done some work in Africa, not just in North Africa, um, what is the response? What is the attitude of governments in, in other parts of Africa if uh, there is something that you've done already? Thank you. Hello? Yeah, sorry. Um, the, the work that we're currently doing in the Middle East and North Africa, which is the region that we're covering, uh, North Africa including uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Egypt, and other countries of the Middle East, um, basically is advocacy, capacity building, uh, strengthening communities through a regional um, drug user organization, the Middle East and North Africa uh, organization of people who use drugs um, with members from those countries and basically trying to um, uh, <clears throat> contribute to any um, advancements and developments in this area through coordinating with countries and civil society, local civil society present in these countries. Um, other parts of Africa, uh, our work has uh, been limited to some participation in training because in our trainings, like some participants, because uh, we, do, we, are, we don't cover those countries. Um, I do know though that a couple of countries such as Sudan and Somalia have recently um, uh, gotten um, large uh, funding grants for HIV and harm reduction will be incorporated into these programs. Um, but that's about it. Um, I, I had a question. Um, hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm a graduating medical student uh, from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and I had a question about the role of the mainstream medical community in the war on drugs from sort of a public health standpoint. I feel like the medical community certainly has not helped the, like combat the war on drugs and has probably made it worse. And I was kind of wondering what roles do you think from sort of a research and a practice standpoint that sort of medical folk can do to kind of help reverse the place that we've come to today? Um, did you say you were from Johns Hopkins? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I thought so. I just wanted to, um, so, <laughs> well, no, not in a bad way. I mean, to me, one of the things they could start is by telling the truth. Because, you know, the first teaching surgeon at Johns Hopkins was a drug addict who was addicted to cocaine for years, the entire time that he was teaching at the school. But that never gets talked about, the fact that people can be functioning drug users. When they talk about his career, when they talk about Freud, they never talk about their drug use. Those are like footnotes as opposed to important integral parts of who they were professionally. So just to start with that, number one. Two, to acknowledge that the first victims of the drug war were doctors. You know, when you go back and look at the history, the first prosecutions that happened under the Narcotics Act were of doctors, but not just any doctors, they were mostly Asian doctors. And so there is a history of, of racism and, um, of, of um, attacking the profession, that it was a deliberate effort to separate doctors from drug addicts. So it's not to me surprising that it is the way it is. And the only way that the medical community seems to be able to deal with drug users is in a space of fixing them. But that's how they deal with everybody. So that's not particularly odd either. So my thing, and I'm just gonna put it this way to you and everyone in the room, because I believe that part of our work is about transformation. It's about transforming people, it's about transforming consciousness. But you can't change anything that you have not changed in yourself. So every day I ask myself, how is Trump a mirror of me? Because he is not the problem, we are the problem. 
He is a manifestation of the problem. If we don't like what's showing up in our world, then we have to change the aspects of us that have that show up. So I'm clear, you know, that part of my work has to be about making sure that that transformation is front and center of everything I do, personally, professionally, and organizationally. So I'm, I'm gonna challenge all of us to look at what are the aspects of our everyday activities that contribute to the problems that we're seeking to solve. Thank you. Deborah, you say, oh. <laughs> Um, yes, well, I think with, you know, obviously the health approach to drug use and drug dependency, um, it does provide support in some ways, but I think we lack, you know, um, the criticism of it too, because there are certain effects of it um, that aren't always positive. So we as an organisation have argued that, you know, it tends to pathologise people who use drugs and, you know, put them constantly in this uh, victim mode, or there's this always an assumption that... Um, People who use drugs need to have a health intervention or some type of intervention in their lives, which is not, you know, always true. So I think, you know, um, we have to both recognise that it can be beneficial in some ways, especially if we're move, you know, we're talking about moving from a criminalisation model, but we also have to recognise that it can, you know, have these other effects that aren't always positive and can be quite disempowering, and it tends to also ignore, you know, social structural issues. Um, and, you know, stigma and discriminate. There's a lot of stigma and discrimination within the healthcare model. So I think we just have to keep that in mind. Um. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Elmer Azak. I'm uh, with uh, WARS, it's Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction. And I would just like to uh, thank everybody here on a panel and also people that have sponsored me and my colleague to come here from Vancouver. Uh, the poorest, po uh, they, they call it the poorest uh, postal code in uh, Canada or in Vancouver, uh, BC. And it is, trust me. But it's the richest and people don't see that. I just see judgment, uh, prejudice, racism and discrimination against whether, it doesn't matter what color, that because they're all there. We're all together in, in a community that cares, which is, uh, Sad to see that uh, all of that poison that they talk about is right in that small little area. And yet, it's taking hold and taking grasp of um, uh, harm reduction in a way that the whole area, uh, downtown east side, has um, taken in, they, everybody's been trained in Narcan. Everyone, like telling you, people that you don't expect are training, elders are getting trained, people in the workplace down, right down there are, are getting trained. Even though we're getting gentrified out of that area, we're getting pushed out of that area right from, you know, that uh, they, uh, to uh, First Nations, not just First Nations, but all different organizations that can afford to live in that area, because it's poor, it's a poor area and it's rich. That, that area used to be called, uh, basically, uh, uh, Hastings, right on Hastings, that used to be a rich area way back in the day of a lot, a lot of people that are, are seniors or elders that are, that, you know, that used to be rich, but I'm letting you know that it's going to be the Robson Street again because that's what they're doing. They're pushing us out and the rich are coming in. And that's pretty sad to see that uh, they have to push people out that are living like they are. But they, they got to remember that their kids as well, their kids are going to come into town, which is showing itself quite prevalent. Uh, they've taken hold and they're, the death rate has lowered so much, now it's coming in from the surrounding communities that they're not looking at that. There are people that are dying out there that haven't taken hold of minoxin, that don't even believe in this. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Like the communities around are not taking control and not being responsible because their kids are coming down to the east side and they are dying there. They don't want to be recognized. And they are, the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm letting you guys know that how can we as First Nations, and I am First Nations, my mother and father are First Nations, Eagle and Raven. And did you guys know that uh, because I'm a product of residential school, that uh, all the things that they're finally recognizing us as uh, damaged goods, that we are damaged from residential school, and there was no counseling, there was nothing there for us. We didn't have 911 or we call help for kids for five, six years old that were damaged. And I'm telling you, there's nothing still in place for us. 
They're taking everything away from us downtown and east side. Funding is going to people that will look after us. Under the Indian Act, we're still under control. And uh, that's sad to see that as a Canadian, uh, Canadian country that we are still held down. We're third world basically living in a rich, rich, rich country that's supposed to be giving, money, giving back to our people, which is not happening because the reserve system is not even included in this. First of all, last year when I attended a conference, I asked how many people that are working in the communities, First Nations, at a level higher than province and provincial. What, three people, First Nations, held up their hand. That's sad to see in a country that's supposed to be 30% employment, employable for First Nations. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Powell from Australia. Um, first up, I'd like to concur with the, the, the previous comment about the panel. I, I was at the first conference in Liverpool, and I've never been at a conference where the opening plenary, or very few plenaries, are made up of all women. In Australia, we, we're part of a gender equity drive where we're actually told we can't go to conferences unless we can identify 50% of plenary uh, participants being women, and I've taken a photo which I shall send back to our institute that they can post on our website. It's an international first. I've never ever been at an international conference, an AIDS conference or a harm reduction conference. I was blown away when I saw this, so that's the comment I'd like to make if I could. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say hello to Ernie. Hi, Ernie. Uh, who was also at the first conference. Um, I also have a question. Um, it's very, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the basic aid around the world, international aid, there's, there's now very few countries that are contributing anything like 0.05% of their gross domestic product to international aid. I, I've been working in international health for 30 years. Where I now live, I haven't got an Australian accent because so I was born in Ireland through London, now in Australia, Last week, there was another huge reduction in our international aid program. I work across the Asia-Pacific region, and that has a major impact on all those countries. And at the bottom of the pile, not surprisingly, is work around harm reduction and HIV prevention and the prevention of, of diseases that are predominantly impacted upon the poorest, the most marginalised, the least and the last and the lost of our world. So I, I do have a question to Katie, actually. I'd be very interested if you could tell us, is there any progress at all around the 10 by 20, or is it going to be another target that we're going to hear about for many years, like the 90, 90, 90, the 10 by 20, all the different ones we've had? I'd just be really like to know if there's any tangible impact so far in terms of other advocacy or anyone taking this up. Thank you. I think there is some progress. It's, it's marginal. Um, we have a champions network that HRI is setting up um, for champion countries. Um, and you see, I mean, essentially, it's, it's for governments to step up and actually start doing something. There is limited international funding. We know that it's reducing. Um, and if you look at countries like the Czech Republic, you see, you've seen a huge uh, decrease in... HIV among people who inject drugs and, you know, hepatitis programs are now being rolled out. That, I mean, there is some, there's definitely some hope. Um, but yeah, it's, it's at uh, venues like this where people can get together and we can actually hopefully make a real difference and kind of shout our message loudly. Thanks. Oh, just over there. Uh, Judy? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I listened to Kate's talk. I listened to all of the talks. And they're all of them saying something that Deborah said so well, which is we're part of the movement for social justice and rights and things. My question is if we're part of that movement, we obviously need to ally with all the other people who are trying to replace this system with something we can live in. The hard question, it seems to me, is how can we act 
to make them want to ally or even tolerate us? And that's a very serious question. Thank you. Um, well, I think it takes a lot of work, particularly um, as networks of people who use drugs, obviously due to the stigma and discrimination. Um, and I think, as I said, you know, in the opening, I think change is a slow process. Um, but I think there are kind of moments of uh, well, there's opportunities, so such as, you know, leading up to, you know, the UNGAS. Um, there was a lot of civil society momentum around that, and it drew a lot of attention to, um, you know, the need for drug policy reform, people arguing around that, you know, other social organisations working towards social justice, women's organisations. And so I think, you know, those key moments... Um, are those key members look to align with other organisations and, you know, try and align your arguments, um, because drug policy reform is about social justice, to elements of, you know, their work. So, you know, with the women's movement, you know, linking sexual reproductive health rights, you know, um, is obviously an issue that faces women who use drugs, um, you know, bodily, bodily integrity, um, violence. Um, so I think, you know, themes like that, you try and work out, you know, the common platforms and then approach them and, you know, link up um, narratives and strategies. Can I say something? Um, I think that we also have to expand how we define our work. Some of the most so I've done a lot of traveling as part of my work in drug policy reform. And the most educational part of it has been when I went to places like Brazil and Colombia and visited the farmers whose crops had been exfoliated as part of the um, coca eradication program. That to me, interacting with people who've been displaced from their land is also harm reduction. When I went to Brazil last year, I had all these meetings with black women who expressed themselves as experiencing genocide right now because of both the killing of black men and the level of incarceration in their country, which is so terrible that when I came back, I told my colleagues that black Brazilians would be grateful for the kind of policing that black Americans are protesting. That's how fucked up it is in Brazil. It is the second leading cause of death of black people, after black people killing each other, because it's the drug war has become this great umbrella to facilitate the genocide of black people, brown people, and indigenous people. And it's not just in the denial of services. It's in all the different things that we've been talking about and that are designed to facilitate early death. Genocide isn't just lining people up and shooting them. It's creating policies and practices that are designed to lead to early death. And in the Americas, from Canada to Chile, those countries are still engaging in policies of genocide against the same people that they've been engaged in for the last 400 years. And the drug war is a very convenient umbrella for that. So if we begin to see ourselves as part of the people who are fighting those struggles, not just delivering needles and syringes to people, and I'm not saying that's not a good thing. I'm not in any way disparaging our work. I'm arguing for us to expand the bandwidth around how we think about what we do as being harm reduction. I want for a couple of more questions. I think there was one up the back. Yeah, I'm here. Oh. My name is Bernice. I come from Kenya, Nairobi, and I work for Kanko. Currently, we implement a project in Eastern Africa in eight African countries, and it's HIV and harm reduction. I wanted to reach out to the panelists who talked about the Middle East and North Africa. Yes, we are in East Africa. We have formed the East Africa Harm Reduction Network. We are doing advocacy with policymakers, and we have formed new networks. And the gap that we have right now is about capacity building. 
A lot of policymakers really do not know what harm reduction is. And when you go to a forum, they ask you, what's the difference between you and the person who is promoting drug use? So I want to reach out. Um, we are in East Africa. We need capacity. A peer-to-peer -peer approach would really help us a lot. Thank you. Maybe one more before we... Um, hi, it's Scott Burris from Philadelphia. Uh, Deborah, you kind of alluded to this several times, but something you also mentioned when we were talking last night. I wonder if you could riff a little bit on your views about the importance of talking about healthy, normal, adaptive drug use. Okay. Um, <laughs> she's like, what did you say and what do you mean? She's asking me, Olga. So we're talking about the fact that not all drug use is bad. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and that seems like a, like a simple thing to say, but I guess, so this is the thing. When we talk about Duterte, which is important to talk about, he represents the logical extension of drug prohibition, which is why we have to have this fight be about prohibition. He's the logical extension. And as long as we have a frame that says that these drugs are bad and therefore the people who do them are bad, we're always going to have people like that who can exploit that fear to justify the punishment. And so the thing that Scott and I were talking about is that part of harm reduction is also fighting against the idea that drug use itself is problematic. And that the people, and, that, and, and even when I was listening to the Minister of Health yesterday talking, and she was talking about you know, the people whose lives are chaotic, et cetera, their lives would be like that whether they were on drugs or not, because they're poor, because they're marginalized, because they have mental health issues. And so we have to stop having it be that this is about the drugs. So that's what we, I hope that's what you were talking about, but yeah. So, um, yes, thank you, everybody, for a very lively discussion and debate. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank our panel, first only panel of uh, major first plenary of women speakers. Uh, and from very diverse range of backgrounds, researchers, harm reductionists, communities, people who use drugs. Um, you know, I think what's really come out here and what we hear all the time is that we really need to bring, you know, politics back into harm reduction, um, you know, politicise it again. And I think, you know, this debate really reflected that. You know, we talked a lot about, um, well, you know, put the lens on inequality, which I think, you know, obviously the war on drugs drives inequality, but it's always been about um, inequality too and othering and exclusion, excluding one category of um, people. Um, so yes, I think moving forward, you know, we want um, nothing less than decriminalisation if we are to do harm reduction properly and the legal regulation of drugs that's not, you know, fo focused on profit but really about people's lives. Um, so, you know, the thoughts that we have, well, that I have in moving forward um, and the theme of this conference, looking back to the theme of the conference is you know, placing people who use drugs at the heart of the response um, which feeds into Input's principle of nothing about us without us. Um, so we should keep this in mind in every forum where people who use drugs are on the agenda, for net national networks, regional networks, global networks. Um, you know, this is something we'll always be pushing for allies, harm reductionists and drug policy reformers. Um, you know, we also hope that you'll advocate for our inclusion. It's no longer acceptable or ethical or good practice, you know, to speak on um, what's best for drug users without consultation, without giving people who use drugs a seat at the table, and without a real belief that people who use drugs have agency and that our lives and knowledge have real and tangible value. And that, you know, our decision-making capacities may exceed sometimes those of social, socially acceptable experts. So, thank you.
Thank you.